Thank you for tuning into this episode. I'm very excited. I hope you had a great holiday break. I tried to enjoy it myself. Um, thank you for tuning into the podcast. If you're a new listener, hi, nice to meet you. So before I dive into today's topic, I have some exciting news. I have launched my own books and vibes store on Amazon. It's my personal bookstore. That's the way I like to see it. So um, this has been something I've been wanting to do for a while, and I was actually able to put it together. I think the most popular question I get is, what do you recommend reading or what are your favorite books? So I have the answer to all of that in my bookstore. I will put the link in the description, um, and I will be populating this more and more over the next few weeks, but they are organized in terms of genre. So we have sociology books, we have tech philosophy books, Taoist books, um, even fun things like art and poetry. So all of my favorite reads are there. Everything that I've recommended is stuff that I have read and that I think you will really, really enjoy. So check it out. Like I said, I want to uh, add some descriptions to it over time and just kind of make notes of what are my favorites and what I re recommend them for. But if you could just be patient as I, we get that <laughs> all up. Um, but yeah, so please check it out. Link is in the description. Let's get into today's topic. This is a big one. I feel like they're all big ones. But this is big for me because I feel like it connects to tech philosophy, it connects to civilization, it connects to these really macro ideas that I love to talk about and I know that you guys love to talk about as well. And that is individualism versus collectivism and sort of deciding which one is better for society. And you'll see as the episode goes on, that's a rhetorical question. I don't really think one is better than the other. But I do think that they are worth exploring in further depth because I think we don't really think about those differences. So you might be asking, why is this relevant? Why would I care about something like this? And I think what I hope you get out of this episode is after hearing these details, it can help you appreciate individuals, right? Individualistic people and individualistic cultures. But I think it'll also help you appreciate groups and collectivist uh, societies and cultures and what they have to offer. So the first question, I think the way that I'm going to be going over these details is first just kind of asking ourselves, you know, what roles do groups play in society? Now, when I say groups, when I'm talking about collectivism, I'm talking about groups like schools. It could be preschools. It could be colleges. It could be committees. It could be networks of people. It could be corporations, just groups of people. What role do they play in society? That's a question we'll be exploring. And another question we'll be exploring is, of course, what roles do individualists play in society? And that is definitely the rebels and the outcasts and the people who just do not want to conform or fit into the expected, um, you know, expectations that they have. So I don't, like I said before, I don't think one is better than the other. I think it's definitely more about having balance. And we definitely have to start off this conversation by acknowledging that the United States is a very individualistic nation, right? This country was founded on the ideas of personal freedom and the, literally the right to what is documented as the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. Of course, there was an asterisk that we all know of on these documents, but the ideology behind you know, people coming to this country and taking it over and what they envisioned was, this is a nation where people can pretty much do whatever they want. Um, and I, as I said, there are asterisks to that. We know that that is not 100% fact, but what is fact is that the theory of that was real and I think still is real and is practiced all the time. Now, the pros of an individualistic culture is, of course, that you can be recognized and even admired for those things that make you different, for those things that make you weird. American culture loves 
the weirdos um, in the sense that you look at cultural trails like Madonna or Lady Gaga or people who make it into this mainstream current tend to have a bunch of eccentricity to them and we really like seeing how weird they can be. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point of aspiration to be a free individual, right? And like I said, it's almost as if the more weird you are, the better. And another pro of an individualistic culture is that you're not weighed down by social conventions or expectations that might outcast you. So you're not weighed down by the expectation of needing to marry at a certain time or needing to inherit a certain caste or those are things that, yeah, of course they happen in American culture, but for the most part, a lot of that fades away, especially when those traditional cultures, people from where it be Indian or certain other parts of, of India or, sorry, Asia or Africa, a lot of those traditions have been known to kind of crumble when they get here because, you know, the kids grow up in American culture and they say, I don't want to do this, dad, or, you know, I know you came here to this country, but I want to be something else. And there's that common sort of generic dynamic that we've seen of the parent being like, what? You know, like, you can't, you can't fray away, but the whole point of the American culture is, yes, fray away, do what you want to do. You don't have to do what people tell you. So, of course, there's pros to that. Of course, there's freedom to that. Um, and in less individualistic cultures, like I was saying, in India, other parts of Asia, Africa, it's all over the world, right? They tend to look down on individualism because they perceive it as a threat to order. Many cultures who are collectivists see the role of that collectivism keeping things solidified, keeping things um, going in a certain pattern that is predictable and stable, and they like that. So some of the pros of collectivist culture is that there tends to be less confusion about what role you're expected to have. People pretty much know by the time you're born <laughs> what you're gonna be doing for work, probably who you're gonna marry, and you know other details, maybe what you'll inherit, uh, inherit things like that. And another pro of collectivist culture is that in some cases, you will have better physical and financial protection based on being in a community who does business together. So of course there are some, you know, and then the, of course you have these collectivist cultures who come to the United States and they do their best to preserve this and they, they segregate their neighborhoods and they make sure they only circulate their dollar in their um, economies. And <clears throat> we get to see a preview of that and for those of us who grew up with less of that collectivist um, ideology. And so you get to see like, wow, you know, I remember going to school and some of my um, <clears throat> some of my Jewish friends were inheriting buildings, you know what I mean? And they knew that as kids. And I'm like, damn, that's nice, you know? So th those are certain pros that can come, not always, but that can come and you see more often in collectivist ideologies. So, and cultures. <clears throat> now, let's start talking about some cons here. Um, some of the cons about individualistic culture, and now we're back to individualistic, by the way. So some of the cons about individualistic culture is you might not have that same kind of protection, right? That physical protection, um, meaning like you might not live in a neighborhood where someone could just run up on you um, and or without punishment. Like you might live in a neighborhood where you're more vulnerable and someone can attack you, which is a real fear. And growing up in New York, you know, I've always wanted to feel like I'm protected on the streets that I'm on. And so when you come from a more collectivist culture, um, and that could be, again, some of, some of it can be foreign um, cultures that are coming in, but you can see those cultures sprout up in American culture. Um, I know growing up, I was in some neighborhoods with lots of gangs, and there was this code of ethics of who you could and could not kind of mess with on the street including um, not just other gang members, but family members and, and um, you know, relatives and stuff like that. So a con of the individual, 
individualistic cultures, you might not have that same kind of physical protection and, of course, that financial protection. If it's one man for themselves, that means there's less likely that there's a net to fall back on, a financial net or just general credit, uh, being in an ecosystem of people who have credit. And those things make a huge difference for your livelihood. So it can be harder to defend your ideals or even your sa physical safety all alone. Now, um, another con is on the emphasis on individualism is that it can sometimes overwhelm people with too many freedoms, too many options of what to be as far as career or maybe even the type of person you wanna be, what type of like identity you wanna have. And that overwhelm of too much options can get in the way of making us happy, right? It can make us feel more isolated and removed from our communities because instead of having this kind of pre-grooved road of our what is expected, some people don't want all this freedom. They, they would rather someone be like, hey, you know, we, we thought about you before you got here and all you have to do is X, Y, and Z and you'll be good. Um, and again, that's not going to work for everybody, but we're just talking about general pros and cons here. So now I want to talk about some cons of the collectivist communities is, of course, that if you so happen to not agree or enjoy the customs that are expected in these cultures, whether it be certain beliefs you're supposed to have, jobs you're supposed to have, whatever, um, your only options, unfortunately, in collectivist culture is when you don't agree is to either try to stomach it and kind of live like a fake life where you pretend to like it, or you somehow remove yourself and kind of get excommunicated with by your closest relatives. I've heard of this happen before too, and it breaks my heart of parents not talking to their kids because they d decided not to be doctors, or parents not talking to kids because they are a certain sexual orientation or because they had kids out of wedlock or something like that. And so collectivist communities can be really harsh on um, those, like, those rules being broken. So, of course, if you don't like those rules, or if you don't feel good about those roles that you're expected to act out, then it can feel like hell. And I think we see that more often in American culture because, because since we are such an individualistic culture, we are more familiar with the narrative that conformity is a threat, that tradition is a threat, that collectivism is a threat because, again, the... Uh, general American citizen really values being able to do whatever the hell they want, even if it's freaky or weird or um, unethical in the eyes of whatever collectivist community they're coming from. So I really love this topic and I was able to indulge in this topic in one of Jonathan Haidt's books. He is a sociologist who explores the polarization of the United States and really the world. And I actually saw him speak like in 2015 and I've always, always been truly captivated by his work. He has been exploring how America in particular has become so polarized politically and has really fascinating research and theories around how it has come to be through various types of causes. Um, some of them, of course, are social media. Some of them are, um, well, you'll see if you read the book, but we're, we'll be talking about some of them. And of course, this book is in my Amazon um, Books and Vibes store, so you can definitely check it out there. But wow, I could not let go of this book. I read it probably in like two sittings. It was that good. Um, and the book is called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And I mean, what a fascinating topic. I think that I'm, he, one of the things he stresses is the importance of intellectual and ideological diversity. Diversity is a big topic right now. Everybody's talking about the importance of having different um, people <laughs> uh, trying to reach one goal. And it's usually focused on race or it's focused on gender. We don't see it so much focused on um, 
philosophy or intellectualism. And as someone who grew up with a whole bunch of different perspectives and a whole bunch of crazy but loving family members with different ideas, um, I, I always wanted to better understand why people get so polarized about certain topics. And I always saw how much that polarization can cause barriers in communication. And as someone who cares so much about mediums and communication, how can I not be fascinated? So in this book, he breaks down specifically moral psychology. He kind of talks about um, what it used to be and what it is starting to become. What I mean when I say what it used to be is what psychologists used to think it was and what research and newfound research is showing that it actually is. And moral psychology is just kind of the fancy way of saying the study of how we determine what is good and what is bad. And moral psychology is the framework we use to instill the ethics in our society. What, no matter what society you're in, it has a moral psychology, it has a way, general way of understanding what is good and what is bad. And obviously, individualistic societies have a different moral psychology, or the way he puts it, a moral matrix, than a collectivist society. And so one of the quotes I loved from the book is he says, for millions of years, our ancestors' survival depended on their ability to get small groups to include them and trust them. Trust is going to be a big theme that we are going to go deeper into th this episode. So um, if there is any innate drive here, it should be a drive to get others to think well of us. That's the end of that quote, by the way. He's basically saying that civilization ha was formed through this social contract that is morality. And morality is dependent on reputation. And um, it's really, really fascinating. And he kind of talks about how he went from, you know, coming from one moral matrix and not being able to interpret things that he felt were immoral as possibly um, moral to someone else. So for example, he talks about going to India and he, I think was raised in New York or California, I don't know, but he had some pretty, you know, standard um, Western ideology about um, castes and about, um, you know, he talks about like he saw women serving dinner and he felt uncomfortable and it made him feel a little squirmish because he felt like women shouldn't be servers. And he talks about how after a few, I think, weeks there, he started to see a bigger pattern in the way, uh, I guess, the part of India he was in was operating. And that instead of first judging, you know, the woman who was serving her husband food and thinking of her as oppressed, he saw that through spending more time there, why it made sense in their community and with their order. So again, this is fascinating. I really want to make sure I'm not um, implying any good or bad here, but just kind of opening the conversation up because I know this is touchy for people. And that's kind of the point is that how can we start to have these conversations without automatically clamming up and being like, ew, that's bad or ew, like that's evil or having that type of judgment. So he says in the book that individualistic cultures such as the U.S., um, that most of them can be described by the acronym WEIRD, which I think is great. WEIRD stands for Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic. And he even says, the weirder you are, the more you will see a world full of separate objects rather than relationships. Whew, you know that gets my tech philosophy mind going. The weirder you are, the more you will see a world full of separate objects rather than relationships. Well, what does this remind us of? In last week's episode, I talked about how with technological reification, we mistake the map for the territory. We create um, fragments out of one thing that isn't 
really broken apart. So the example I gave in the episode was time. Time is not a bunch of separate objects connected together. They're not a bunch of milliseconds connected together. A millisecond is a perception. It's a abstract concept. And it really will F up your experience of being in the present if you, ex if you believe that it's little milliseconds tied next to each other. And if you don't see time as this omnipresent relationship and a part of inherent existence, then yeah, you might have a difficult time almost doing anything <laughs> because you'll feel this false pressure coming from this um, perception of a world of separate objects. So whenever you're talking about Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, this acronym he uses, whenever you're talking about Western anything, you're talking about a perception that wants to break everything apart, including us, right? <laughs> How do you get an individualistic culture? Well, you have to first think that you as an individual are separate from everybody else. <laughs> and that's what gave people the nerve to kind of come here and take over and pursue these individualistic pursuits and in kind of how we are here now. And of course, it has its pros and it has its cons. That's why I covered that first. So um, his research is showing why um, these larger en entities that aren't so individualists that are more about the sum of people um, and the sum of people who compose them, that how, how much they are real, how much these groups are not these uh, you know, facades, they really matter. And he talks about why they must be protected to keep a certain integrity of humanity and meaning in life. So in collectivist cultures, people look at individualists as, um, you know, they look at this idea of, you know, should you design your own life or pursue your own goals? They see that as kind of selfish and dangerous, which to our American ears or wherever you are um, <laughs> can be like, damn, like, what do you mean? It's dangerous for me to do what I want? Well, on a macro scale, it kind of is. <laughs> Um, because, again, the way that a lot of these collectivist cultures have come to be is they see too much individualism as a way to weaken the social fabric and destroy the institutions and collective entities which everybody depends on. So that's a lot to take in because when you start talking about where we are now, when it comes to technology, when it comes to the pandemic, um, we are... We, we live in a large, anonymous society. We don't really know each other. Not the way we used to, as far as a uh, species of humans. And there are a lot of questions that come up about how has that changed us? How has this particular moral psychology worked and hurt and um, have harmed us? So um, the story about him going to India and kind of realizing over time that, you know, hey, maybe I shouldn't be judging these people for living differently than me. Like, yeah, maybe through my Western eyes, I see this as wrong or oppressive, but if I take a step back and try to see why they do this, or if there is a reason why, because the point of this book is exploring how the quickness to dismiss something just because you think it's bad, can get in the way of you understanding how it is possible for someone else to see the reason to do it. You know, if you immediately think, you know, and I see this very much with the homemaking stuff. Um, I, had a, I had an episode about how much I love to be a homemaker and how this same ideology is quickly applied to homemaking where I noticed as a kid, I would get more stars and stripes because of the, the parents I had. Some parents want you to be a homemaker. My parents were very much like, you know, try to be the president of the United States, like something like super ambitious. They didn't really ask me to do that, but you know what I mean? Like that was like, it was supposed to be this really progressive push to be like super successful CEO boss person. And I went and I went and I went and I pushed it to the point that I realized 
there ain't nothing up here for me. This is actually very painfully lonely. And as a woman is making 10 times harder for me to connect to any person, um, I felt very scammed. And I'm like, wait, hold up. My nana had it all right with the baking the cookies and keeping the house nice and having a, fu- a, a fucking like sanctuary to just relax and rejuvenate in. Like, that's my thing. So that's why I love this type of research because it just creates a little bit more of a pace. It creates a little bit more space between what your moral matrix is and other people's and um, and how much of that has to deal with the way you perceive the way you think the world should work and, and also how it actually does. So you may think like, yeah, individualism is great and you know, there should be no problem if we pursue it to its ultimate point. But again, the whole point of this book, the whole point of this podcast episode is really exploring, well, hey, maybe there's something about that whole like human beings getting along in groups thing that (laughs) um, actually can really add some depth to our life. So he has a quote here that I wanted to share. He says, I could see beauty in a moral code that emphasize self-control, resistance to temptation, cultivates of, of one's higher, nobler self, and negotiation of the self-desires. Woo, I just got chills. The reason why this is so impactful is because he's basically seeing, he's basically saying, I could see someone controlling their uh, kind of like monitoring their stimuli. That's the way I interpret that which is the opposite of what American culture does, and I've talked about this before, where we see any um, capping of stimulants, we see any like holding back of just pure ecstasy as like, oh, you should be able to explore your ecstasy to its ultimate point. That's such an American thing. You should be able to just you have whatever you want and there should be, you know, there's this idea of the abundance going around, which I think is hilarious because we are losing natural resources every day. (laughs) And people keep talking about all this abundance. Yes, we are abundant in cash. We are abundant in fiat government printed money. We are not abundant in water. We are not abundant in a lot of these other natural resources that you need to freaking live, including the goddamn ozone layer. So the talk about abundance is funny. I think it's cute in the sense that, yeah, you know, we should we should definitely, like, see the real abundance that we have as far as just, like, being, you know, the earth revolving around the sun. That's great. But, <laughs> you know, it's just when we start talking about, like, Ferraris and stuff like that, I'm like, I just roll my eyes. But that's just me. Um, because, again, here success is exploiting your goals. I, I get sick. I'm, I forgot. Um, somebody was on the explore page and like somebody was talking about like, oh, you know, you know, um, the universe's plans is bigger. Everything is bigger. Like whatever you think, think bigger. And I understand the general like notion of that. But again, I'm not even shitting on it. All I'm going to say is that's American. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not even going to shit on it. I'm not even going to say my personal opinion, which you could probably guess what it is. All I'm going to say is that's the American version, and it juxtaposes what with what Jonathan is saying in this quote where he says, I could see beauty in a moral code that emphasized self-control, resistance to temptation, cultivation of one's higher nobler self and negotiation of the self's desires negotiation what a beautiful way of talking about that because usually when we're talking about collectivist societies we see this as an oppressive conformity as you have no choice but a negotiation Oh, baby, that's leveling. That's not saying you can't have some of your self desires. It means, will you develop a relationship where you negotiate what is your point of preservation? What is the way you create sustainability instead of toxic growth? So um, it gets deeper. So as I was saying, society is a social contract invented 
for our mutual benefit. And the way it is structured is based on our moral psychology, which is deeply based in whether or not we see ourselves as, um, or we feel we should prioritize ourselves as individuals or as groups. And he talked about in the book how um, moral diversity can, the lack of the moral diversity can so easily divide good people into hostile groups that don't want to understand each other. It's not even about, I want to hear what you have to say, even if I completely disagree. It's just, it just turns into too hostile of a situation. So there were some other really fascinating notes um, that I, I took note of in the book. One of them being that uh, the difference between what a society looks like when individuals compete with individuals and when groups compete with groups. So he says how indi when individuals compete with individuals, that type of competition rewards selfishness. And that's where capitalism usually, usually gets the shit stick because people blame capitalism for the nation's um, selfishness this like greed, blah, blah, blah. But in a lot of ways, you can be capitalist and very collectivist, which I see all the time. I mean, there's parts of Brooklyn where you will feel very much like you are an outsider. <laughs> there's parts of Manhattan where you know you ain't on your turf and there's a very collective capitalist economy going. Um, and the difference between groups competing with groups is that competition um, favors groups composed of true team players instead of individualists. So it's just like sports, you know? You can't, d there's certain sports where it's one-on-one, -on -one, but then there's certain sports where the merit of the team, the, the strength of the team is in the, the team. It's not in the one person. You can't just shine, you can't just be one great player in a sport that requires you to play in teams. And the premise of this book is really saying, hey, humanity is teams. It's a sport of teams. It always has been. And whether or not you like that, it's what it's been. It's what it is. And he goes into how it's in our genes and all this stuff. So I can't go into all the details, but he has, you know, the research and all this fascinating um, new stuff about it. So, um, yeah, so when individuals compete with individuals, it does include some forms of strate strategic cooperation, but it does not compare to groups competing with groups because those who are willing to cooperate and work for the group, for the good of the group, um, they, they're a better teammate. It's about teams. And so this process of individualism and collectivism has pushed human nature in different directions and gave us the this uh, mix of selfishness and selflessness that we know today now um that's a lot to think about these are notes from the book that i'm referencing by the way so another thing that he wanted to make sure was noted is that he did not want to give us the impression that when he says groups competing, that he means like fights or war or anything like that. Competing in this context is um, about who is the most efficient at turning resources into offspring. It's less about fighting, honestly, and it's more about cooperation. Um, <clears throat> real authentic groupishness, the way he likes to explain it, is focused on improving the welfare on the in-group more than it's about harming the out-group. So if you're in the in-group, it means you're not worried about like defeating the outsiders, you're just more worried about like sustaining your group. Um, so when we talk about how did individualism rise, it came out of the notions of the self um, in philosophy and psychology in Europe beginning in the 16th century. Um, and again, the self is a concept <laughs> a European concept, because before the self, 
uh, most of humanity did not perceive themselves as a separate part, right? But because of this type of psychology, these cultural changes, um, they accelerated during the Enlightenment period and the Industrial Revolution, and it is that process that gave rise to the weird culture that I talked about before, the Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, and <laughs> he says in the book, I love this, that the weirder, right, the weirder you are, the harder it is to understand what those quote unquote savages were doing. I don't know, I, I'm sure you've read those um, letters from like Columbus or whoever, and they get to the new land and they have all this nasty stuff to say about the savages and oh my God, you know, they don't wear clothes and da da da. And I laugh at those so much because. <laughs> It's a way to, I mean, what is a savage, right? It's, it's like, that's all tech philosophy. That's you, literally the author of those types of letters sees themselves as superior by a way of what technology they have created. And they think that, oh, because this society doesn't use guns to shoot each other, well, they're beneath us. Well, okay. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's sad for sure but there's humor in it call it dark humor um wow if you needed a better example a better reflection of what tech philosophy is read those letters right so another thing he says in the book is that a nation of individuals um and he talks a lot about Durk Durkheim who was a sociologist and kind of predicted all this stuff way before any of we had all this like evidence not even just predict it, just theorized it, kind of put it together and compiled it. Um, I have his book as well. I will make sure, I think, I don't know if it's in the Amazon store, but check it out. Um, <laughs> what Durkheim said was that a nation of individuals um, is likely to be, individualists is likely to be hungry for meaning. Well, remind you of anything? Depression skyrocketing up. Anxiety skyrocketing up general sense of like lostness skyrocketing up <clears throat> so one last note before I go into the trust dynamic that I wanted to break down is Haidt says that um you know they, they ran some tests I guess and they found that it was oxytocin that is produced when People feel bonded to people, and they showed that the oxytocin binds people to groups and not to all of humanity. So he talks about how the desire for the whole world to kind of do a kumbaya, and it doesn't matter what you look like or where you're from, we should all just hold hands, that it is so theoretical and so non-human that literally our um, bodily responses don't respond to that. You will only, your, your um, oxytocin will only bond you to a group. It cannot bond you to strangers. It cannot bond you to random people all over the world. Um, and I forgot what study they did, but it's all in there and it goes into detail. But it was something like they kind of just like tested people. I think people who were like who grew up around them and then like random strangers, whatever. It was very fascinating. But, you know, <laughs> I grew up with, again, relatives with very differing views. And some of them were these really nice, theoretical, oh, if we could all just hold hands and get along in the whole world. And it's, it's like, hell yeah, sign me up, world peace. Oh, yeah. Like, who doesn't want to believe that that would be awesome. It is awesome to believe that. But again, the point of the book, the point of this conversation is that science shows that we bond more to groups, which it's like, I mean, couldn't we have guessed that, right? It's really important as someone who, I guess I consider myself a realist, also love my, my Zen practice, my Taoism practice, is to not force my projections, to not force my um, ideals onto the nature of reality. It is what it is. 
you know what I mean? Like, it is what it is that, okay, we are species that, it doesn't mean we have to go to war. It doesn't mean we have to, like, hate each other. But I think it would really offer some clarity when we better understand that we have self-domesticated by a way of creating groups and civilizations. And the groups can be small or they can be large. But the point is, to try to force everyone to get along is unnatural. Not even just, I think, I think civility is possible, but sincere love for everyone, I don't know, up for debate. Let's take it to the lab, right? All right, <laughs> so what does all of this really come down to? What does all of this really come down to? Am I saying, oh, well, we should all just be collectivists and never expand our individual nature? Well, take two seconds to look at my life. You'll see that is not the case. I think I'm one of the most individualistic people I know, which is cool in some ways. And in some ways, I've seen how it's been damaging, to be honest. So I'm not I'm definitely not saying, oh, let's all just conform to like whatever, first religion we ha have for grabs or whatever. No. It's saying that it all comes down to trust. Trust? Well, what's missing? What's missing? Is it about individualism and collectivism as much as it's about trust? We, collectivism happens and the strength of it the pros of it are that you feel like you can trust the people around you oh my god well that's foreign to american culture we don't want to get to know our neighbors we don't want our kids on the street we don't trust nobody <laughs> and it's even crazy to think that there was a time where you could trust people I'm talking about people in your neighborhood. I'm talking about the butcher, the baker, baker the candlestick maker. Got it right this time. Whoa. Trust? What's that all about? Yes, trust. It's rare. Oh, it's hard. Oh, if you're in business, you know. You know that when you're in business, after a while, you're like, it ain't about that this it ain't about the website it ain't about the followers it ain't it's about t-r-u-s-t -T. <laughs> that's what gets shit done in the species that's what gives meaning in the species that's what collectivism has to offer that is what individualism takes away for the most part if it is extended too much so he talks about this in the context of gods and religion. He says gods and religion in some are group level adaptations for producing cohesiveness and trust, which I agree with, but I think it can even be expanded outside of gods and religion. It could be a company you work for. It could be a network or whatever. Um, but I think he was just talking about like how it all got started, right? So when we're talking about ancient Rome, blah, 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 Yes, for, for sure, religion was used as a way to create groups um, for producing cohesiveness and trust. And I love that too, cohesiveness. Cohesiveness. <laughs> that is everything coming together. That is everything, all those little bits coming together and it forms this one thing. And that's the, the cohesiveness comes from the trust, in my opi opinion. So he talked about how much society is based on reputation and how I think what bothers the individualists from the burden of maintaining trust and maintaining your reputation is that you can't really be selfish, right? You can't really be too selfish if you have a uh, reputation to maintain or if you're trying to build trust with people because again you have to there's a certain moral negotiation there's a negotiation of your desires you know that yeah I have the option to be a jerk but if I extend that too much then I'm going to be outcasted because my community is not going to what they're not going to trust me and then there are their own consequences of that so of course it's a balance it's of course it's yes you want to have some of those personal freedoms but 
again, in this country, in this ideology, this tech philosophy. There's, we have created no trust. We're using the tech to, as a way to um, act as the trust, as to build the trust into the certain transactions, um, which is very, I don't think it's dumb, but it's very fascinating to think about because one of the things he brought up, he says that in the medieval world, Jews and Muslims excelled in long distance trade in part because their religions helped them create trustworthy relationships and enforceable contracts. Now, I'm not saying, oh, we should all be Jewish and Muslim. No, I'm talking about the bare bones economics of this. How do you think economics works? You need to be able to trust someone. So when you're thinking about these long distance trades and these enforceable contracts that are social, that are based, the, the, the weight of it is distributed through the community, wow, that really changes life. Um, and when reputations are on the line, there's a reason to create and cultivate that trust. And so here's some of the other scary research in this book is that, um, that he, he was saying that by many different measures, Religiously observant Americans are better neighbors and better quote unquote citizens than secular Americans. Ooh, I'm not judging nobody. This is, I didn't, don't get mad at me. <laughs> I'm not even religious. You know what I mean? I'm not saying we should be, I'm, I'm not saying nothing. I'm just spitting the facts. Don't be mad at the messenger. And that they are more generous with their time and money. And I've heard that before, that like the people who actually donate are, tend to be religious people. And that's because they have a social contract with their community. And it could be um, religious in the sense of motivated by their faith. But th the other thing they were saying is mostly it's not, it's not about faith. It's just about wanting to maintain the reputation in their community. And I think that's what makes all the individualists sick because the individualists are like, oh, you try to use that religion and it controls you and blah, blah, blah. And the, the book is saying, well, the religion's just like, yeah, we agree. Not everyone's following, you know, the rules of God and not everyone's like following these like religious rules to a T, but the, it's keeping a fabric going in our community. And that's why it's worth preserving. So it's, it's oh, it gets nuanced. Oh, it gets nuanced. It gets, it gets very detailed. So um, what a crazy concept. And I think he was saying, too, how um, even to this day, I think there's, like, less contracts in, like, Jewish communities. I don't know. Don't quote me on this. There was something along those lines. And he was basically theorizing because there's a certain level of trust in those communities. So, wow, what does trust have to offer us as far as meaning? Um, as far as feeling like you belong, as far, as far as not feeling like a, like seeing all the merit and just being this weird outcast. He says, and I'll, um, I'm starting to close out. He says, we evolved to live, trade, and trust within shared moral matrices. When societies lose their grip on individuals, allowing to do as they please, the result is often a decrease in happiness and an increase in suicide, as Durkheim showed more than 100 years ago. He says, societies that forego the exoskeleton of religion should reflect carefully on what will happen to them over several generations. What he's saying is that when people are using religion or groups in general, any type of organization of people, I want to be careful not to put, have a value judgment here, right? <laughs> when people forgo that exoskeleton of organization of some tie to each other, there's a reason why you should be indebted to me and I indebted to you, not in a negative way, in a socially responsible way that through you being one part of the net and me being another part of the net we create safety and stability and order for our offspring that if we live in a community and my kid is running around and you happen to be there I trust that you will protect 
them. And you trust that I will protect yours, right? When you get rid of that exoskeleton, he says, we should reflect carefully on what will happen to them over several <laughs> generations. And then he starts saying like, and we're starting to see it now. And it's like, I start crying in the book because, um, yeah, he says the first aesthetic societies have only emerged in Europe in the last few decades. They are the least efficient societies ever known at turning resources of which they have a lot into offspring of which they have few. Ooh-wee. He's saying, yeah, like the efficiency level has gone down. Moral systems are interlocking sets of values, virtues, norms, practices, identities, institutions, technologies, and um, has evolved our psychological moral matrices. Okay. Hello, everybody. Does someone say tech philosophy? So, um, this is a big one, like I said. <laughs> um, it's a great book. Check it out. It really all just comes down to trust. It really comes down to, you know, not seeing society as this random thing you ended up being in, but it can be a tool. It can be a vehicle into purpose, into meaning, and all these things. And I've, I've touched on this before in my previous work, my um, presentation about human-friendly technology and how when we eradicate any inconvenience in the name of tech, we are eradicating character development, um, being able to push through adversity, bonding with our elders, appreciation for our elders. Um, so there's really, really something to say about groups and um, and collectivism in a way that still offers room for individualism. And, um, and <laughs> yeah, and, and how, what, 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 what I think is the point, too, of the book is that the individualists can't create a moral matrix themselves. Or, or if, they, if they do, it's just them. You can't be a society by yourself, but yet we're in a society of people who just think we're by ourselves, generally speaking. And I had been asked in that presentation, um, I'll link to the clip, someone was like, oh, well, you know, do you think capitalist societies can have meaning and what I said was capitalist societies are econo or capitalist economies are, it's an economic philosophy. It's not a moral compass. Like people tend to think that capitalism makes you evil. And uh, I guess whatever, like I think it can aggravate that for some people, but the point more than I'm trying to defend capitalism, the point of what I'm trying to say is like, most of this shit depends less on your economic philosophy and more on your moral compass because there's really nothing that threatening about free trade when your moral compass is like sustainable and healthy for you and your community. But if your moral compass is just about how to be the number one only individualistic, I don't care about nobody self, then yeah. I mean, I don't know how you want to blame that on capitalism. That is, that is a toxic individualist philosophy. That is that weird acronym expressed in its worst manifestation. So, shit, we could, that's what all I'm trying to say is like, when you start, if you're a capitalist and you're thinking with a collectivist mindset, this is about how we get money in everybody's pockets. We're trying to, everybody eats. Everybody has a plate at the table. And we're going to organize ourselves in a way that protects us physically and financially and morally from demoralizing our human nature. Has anyone thought about that? That's how I'd be feeling. So thank you for tuning in. Really, really appreciate you. Um, as always, send me a tweet. Say hello. Share this with someone you think would care. Um, and... 
the conversation continues. <laughs> All right, bye. Thank you for listening to the Alex Wolf Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review. And if you aren't already, make sure you're subscribed to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. For more resources on innovation, economics, and culture, visit alexwolf.co slash newsletter and sign up for my email list. Thanks.